Today, I talk immigration with two of my close friends, Scott Griffin and Tony Rodriguez. Scott immigrated from Scotland and was recently granted United States citizenship. Tony's family swam across the Rio Grande River from Mexico to the United States. Some topics discussed include the American experiment, what America means to immigrants, the strengths and challenges with diversity, the idea of borders, and the challenges with legally immigrating to the United States of America. Just to think of like how far things have come where like you're talking about like, you know, there's so many documentaries now on like literally changing the DNA of like your offspring, mm-hmm. right? You've seen that too. That's another CRISPR. example, right? Yeah. And it, that it really does feel like something that's like a sci-fi movie, right? But you know, to the, to the rich and famous, like it's well, already yeah. a thing, right? By Comes definition, you just said being in the future. We are in the future. Yeah. The reason why we're here is because people in the past have been breeding from different parts of the world and building culture and society. And, and here we are, we're in America, Yeah, you know, and I, I was born here, Scott, you were not Tony, you were, Mm -hmm. but the reason why I wanted to bring you guys on and thank you for being here, by the way, I really appreciate it. I've I've been wanting to talk about this subject for a long time. Great. And we all have different bloodlines. That's like kind of an easy way to to start Mm -hmm. it off. When talking about immigration and how people move, it's fascinating because I'm going to break down mine for a little bit, my family history, and then I want to hear about your guys'. So on my mom's side, uh, her dad, so the Long family, we've been here since 1614. We're some of the first tobacco settlers in Virginia. And I think we're sent by way of the king at that point. So... The idea of that transition, like that immigration story, you're still being like forced to that land to mm-hmm. kind of better the the kingdom. You yeah. know, it, it wasn't for the crown, pure free will. But that was that side, and then my dad's side, my what was it? My great great grandpa was born on the Chickasaw Native American Reservation in Oklahoma, but he was like Scottish English, so he wasn't like Native American, but he was actually working the oil fields there. Right. And my grandma on my dad's side is from Chihuahua, Mexico. Oh, so wow. I, I'm kind of, a, I've got a lot of different, <laughs> of, which they say, uh, what well, genetically it's, it could be good. It's supposed to be good. Right. A little diversification. Mm-hmm. But I've always been so fascinated with different bloodlines for one and just history of where people are coming from and then tying it into the United States and the idea of this American experiment and we're called the melting pot and whatnot now. Mm -hmm. And we're literally the definition of that in here. Grant, what's your nationality? Japanese, Japanese Mexican. We got a hundred percent Scottish. What part of Mexico? Um, South of the border. So it's like right in the middle of Mexico. Um, It's next to, I'm sure you heard of Jalisco. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jalisco. So it's next to that. I hear uh, the women are beautiful there. Yeah, those are all, those are the ones with the lightest skin, the blue eyes. The, all the people from Jalisco are known for that. It's one of these old uh, deliveries at a, or the delivery guy mm-hmm. at my last job. He would talk about the women from there. That's all, <laughs> yeah, that's cool. So you're near Jalisco. Yeah, so close close to there. It's like a mountainous mountainous range. It's not like a big city where they're from. They're both of them from like a pueblo. They both. It's crazy because both my parents are from the same state. Pretty much like an hour's drive away from each other, mm-hmm. um, and they met here. Crazy! Yeah, wow! So it's like, it's, yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. crazy. We're literally the definition <laughs> of America, I would say, and we don't have any female representatives in here. But I find that so fascinating and cool that that's what I think America is. That's what I like to believe. And of course, there's differences in culture where people start judging other people based on their skin color. But yeah. at the end of the day. We all come from different backgrounds and have different storylines since the beginning of time, which led us to this moment Mm -hmm. from just different walks of life, like different people, different cultures. I mean, the the pigment on our skin changing from uh, from science, from the sun, from the place in which our ancestors came from. It's just it's fascinating. So something that politicians have to talk about now is immigration policy. 
it's on the forefront. Uh, we see it. We saw it with Trump um, just putting it in brash ways, calling out certain races of people and just, yeah. just not being the most smart communicator in that moment. But the fact is that we all think about these things now. And I wanted to bring you guys on to hear your story and just to mesh this this complex system of America and where, yeah, I, I just, I want to hear you guys' family story. So Scott, if you can start just about, um, how did you get here, bro? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I'll start at the beginning with, you know, where my parents are from. Uh, they are both from the West side of Scotland. Uh, my dad is from Kilmarnock, which is where I was born and raised as well. And my mom is from an area called Castle Park, probably about 20 minutes away from each other. Um, and they happened to meet through a series of circumstances that are somewhat similar to yours in a certain way. Um, but basically, uh, their family histories are, my mom has done some, you know, research into like where her family come from and they're of Irish descent. I think they moved from Ireland to Scotland in the 1800s. And then my dad was not as aware of his background and, you know, where his family came from. And then all of a sudden, you know, these DNA ancestry mm -hmm. tests like became a big thing, right? Oh, so cool. we uh, we finally convinced him to take one and, and find that out. And my dad tans fairly well, which as part of Scotland is like not a very typical, you know, <laughs> not a very typical uh, like trait. So we assumed maybe some Mediter Mediterranean background or something of that nature. He took the test and it came back 99% Scottish. Oh, so man. like almost like as purebred <laughs> as yeah. you can get. Whoa. So that is very unique, right? You were talking about, you know, like self-proclaimed mutt, right? And I feel like that's typically, yeah. like, you know, you see that a lot when people are like posting their DNA tests and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So that was a big surprise to us. But um, yeah, they were both raised on the West Coast of Scotland. Uh, Kilmarnock, where I'm from, is like essentially an old school mining town that was booming during, uh, you know, the industrial era of the 1800s. Uh, also famously known for being the uh, birthplace of Johnny Walker whiskey. So oh, up wow. until the late 2000s, every bottle of Johnny Walker was distilled and bottled in Kilmarnock. Uh, that was the big claim to fame. So <laughs> very small town for Sc like as far as Scotland is concerned, I would say like maybe like top 15, 20 biggest cities. But even then it's like a population of 40,000. So like wouldn't even be in the te top 10 cities of Orange County, you know? Yeah. It's so, like a neighborhood in Orange yeah, County. <laughs> yeah, some neighborhoods in Irvine probably have like more than that, you know? <laughs> so, so crazy. Very, and because of that, uh, typically a very small town mentality, even to this day, you know, I, I think a lot of people have the mindset there where it's like, you know, oh, I've got everything I need right here, you know? Mm -hmm. Why would I, why would I leave? And Real quick, so you bring up the idea of mindset. That's so important too, because people coming from all around the world, to the United States, whenever you emigrated, whether you were born here or you came here uh, in your own lifetime, it's everyone has their own mindset. So you have a complex system by definition because we know people are different, cultures are different. Absolutely. And everyone's coming to one land under one flag and meshing. Yeah. But just real, I just want to. Now, that's a great point. And I definitely want to get into that more because it's such a big deal. And it definitely shaped where I was from because my dad was so opposite of the traditional mindset of Kilmarnock. My dad from as young as possible, knew that he wanted to get out as soon as he could and didn't necessarily know how or why, but eventually got the opportunity when he was in his late teens to go play semi-professional soccer uh, while doing an apprenticeship in South Africa. So no in the way. late 1980s, this kid from literally small mining town in Scotland goes to South Africa with no idea what's happening there at that time. As I'm sure oh, we all yeah. know, Apartheid, apartheid was in full swing at yeah, that point. Yeah. So he comes from this small town in Scotland and then all of a sudden is, you know, exposed to this whole other story and, and this whole different way of culture and race and how that plays into things. Cause Scotland is like very, very white, at least Kilmarnock, like where I'm from. So for him to get that perspective was something that shaped him for the rest of his life. Um, he, you should have him on the podcast, honestly. Really? He has so many crazy stories. He's told me stories about like hiding in the trunk of cars to get bussed in to like the black neighborhoods to like go play those teams for soccer. And if he had been caught in there, he would have been like arrested and like still be in like South Africa jail, you know? Whoa. Yeah, pretty unbelievable. So to, to get that experience was a huge moment in his life. And his stories from that time have definitely shaped me as an individual as well. 
Um, unfortunately, uh, in his late twenties, he got into uh, a, a motorcycle accident and had to uh, stop playing soccer. Which then eventually he went and lived in Greece for six months and like did island hopping. It was a crazy mm-hmm. story as well. But he eventually ended up back uh, in Kilmarnock. Uh, Is that where you met your mom? And met my mom. So he went to work in a, a company called Flow Laboratories, uh, like a lab setting. And my mom was uh, a cook in the kitchen. So when he would go get his lunch, my mom would like give him like more fries because she like thought he was cute. So <laughs> that was the end. And uh, she was um, always from that area, never really traveled much at that time. But, you know, I fell in love with my dad and, you know, they ended up, you know, having me and my two sisters. And uh, that kind of brings us to the point where we found out we were coming to America. So um, in... 2005, my dad got a job offer to move to America. So it was through his job. And as a kid, I was very excited. You know, you grow up in, in, in a place like that and you watch so many movies and you see so many TV shows and, you know, you, you think about America, you have this perspective of America, right? So I was, I was very excited and, and not hesitant at all to leave. I was you know, you'd think, oh, I'm going to miss my friends and stuff. Mm-hmm. But I was excited to try something different. Was it pop culture painting that excitement or oh, was it really like I, in the classroom or? I think it's a mixture of all of those things. Yeah. I think as a kid, you know, you, you think more of pop culture, definitely having like a heavy impact on that. And, uh, you know, I, I think of a lot of my first experiences in America, the things that really stuck with me were things that I probably got through pop culture. Right. So an example of that is. We, we moved to Maryland, and that whole process of getting the visas and everything was insane. So that was the first stop with Scotland to Maryland? Yes. Okay. Uh, in 2005. And one of the very, very first memories I have was, like, I couldn't get over the fact that there was a McDonald's inside the Walmart. <laughs> like, <laughs> that was just, like, the most unbelievable thing to me just in Scotland. That corporate partner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just feeding yeah. burgers. McDonald's over there. We do like, but in Kilmarnock, it was a huge deal when the McDonald's opened and there was oh, like okay. only one in the whole town. Yeah. Um, so excited. And there was the nothing shittiest food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there was nothing like a, like a Walmart type, you know, there was, yeah, yeah. it was like very much so, um, like, uh, like you would walk to the corner store where you'd get your milk and eggs and your newspaper. Right. So to go into this mega mart with like all these crazy toys and video games and like all these things in one place, it was mm-hmm. like a really incredible experience. And I just remember so vividly, like being like, I can get a cheeseburger in the store where I'm like getting everything else I could ever want. Like it was a really funny experience. So we were there for, um, two years in total. And then in 2007, we found out that we were moving back to Scotland because my dad's work visa had expired. So at that time I was like, you know, okay, well we're going back. Like I knew what to expect this time. The first time, moving to America, I was very much like anticipating like the unknown and like was looking forward to that. But this time I moved back, I kind of got, uh, I I saw my hometown kind of through, uh, new glasses. And and I think a major part of that was, um, in the time that I had left and the time that I had stayed there before I moved back to America, Johnny Walker decided to move all of their operations to China. So they decided to export all of their manufacturing. A huge part of Kilmarnock had jobs at the factory. And then the town was basically like unemployed overnight. So, so what did people do? Was it, it like was just government a, yeah, to save them or? Well, um, you know, there was programs, you know, that people took advantage of. But Scotland or Kilmarnock rather is still recovering to this day. Um, in a kind of darker note, it was actually voted the worst place to live in the UK. So oh, not wow. just like Scotland, but England, Wales, and Northern Ireland too. Like Kilmarnock got that reputation for a bit. So, And that's because of that transaction going to China basically? Or at least one big part of it? Yeah, there's, you know, several things. Like I said, it's just kind of an industrial town by nature. And, you know, all of those kind of cities are struggling just just based on the times and the future, right? Mm -hmm. So it's about Kilmarnock just trying to catch up to that in a sense. Um, And to go from moving to Maryland, where I was, a town called Ellicott City, um, where it was like literally like everything I could have ever imagined, like cookie cutter, you know, big, big house, the big front lawn, like white picket fans. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like to go from that to then go back to Kilmarnock and see how that happened. And, and I think I perspective is really important in this situation, looking back on it now, but I think of, uh, the way that, um, 
you know, interactions, certain interactions happened once I went back to, because Scotland is such a, or Kilmarnock is such a small town mentality. People were kind of like, oh, you know, like he, he moved back here, right? Like all of a sudden if things were different, right? Because I was the one that got they out. They were judging you a little bit? I think so, yeah. So back. that was at least the way that I perceive the way that those interactions and happen And you would have now. been nine at this point? I was 10. 10, okay. So 10 to 12 was that time back. My dad obviously was way more aware of this being an adult um, than I was at the time. And then all of a sudden started working as hard as he could to get back to America, essentially. That came in the form of uh, a job in Texas. Uh, and we moved there in late 2009. Um, since then, I've lived in a bunch of different states. I, I lived in Texas for the majority of middle school and high school. Senior year of high school, moved to San Jose, then moved down here for college, Orange County. Uh, and then when I was in Orange County, my parents lived in Florida for a short time. So I got to see that part of America as well. And now they've just moved here. So for someone that's not from the U.S., I've seen a lot of it as well. And I'm very grateful for that kind of perspective, too. Um, that's crazy. Literally Texas to or Maryland to Texas to Florida. Now, Southern and California. Both, yeah. North that's and South all California. over. Yeah. So yeah. I've seen a lot of it. Um, all within a recent timeline, too. Absolutely. Because all of this history... This immigration story is taking place post 2000. Yeah, 2005 onwards. So it's also like not just from like being a kid, like when we first moved to America, I was eight. So even though that time in Maryland is kind of fuzzy for me, like I very, I have very vivid memories of that entire experience. And I think it's shaped kind of who I am as a person. That's incredible, man. Yeah. I was kind of tripping out on um, being so young when you were describing like the lawn and the white picket fence and like the home and whatnot, right? Like what's attractive about that to, to like a young child almost to where is that commercials? Is it movies where you're seeing that? Is it just the, I think to me, it's, it's a lot of the mentality that comes with those things in a sense, Scotland, the city that I'm from at least was very, gray and industrial and 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 then i moved to america and and i think that um <laughs> i wonder how this is going to come across i would just say as a whole from my personal experience americans are like very polite to each other and hey how's your day how you doing like that's mm -hmm. hey how's it going like that's the whole like traditional mindset of like how like the american is and then scotland i don't want to call it pessimistic because that's such a negative connotation but it's just different right <laughs> and, and things are like a way more blunt and there's definitely positives that come from that. But even kids are going to notice those kind of things. Right. So when I talk mm -hmm. about white picket fence, that doesn't necessarily just mean like the actual house and my physical surroundings. But I think also, you know, the, the, the environment, the mentality of the people that I was interacting with on a daily basis. That makes, I just was talking to um, like my girlfriend's family's from Slovakia. Yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. And they were describing like that's very much how people are over there too is like you americans you're always like smiling or saying hi bye how are you it's like we don't do that it's like everyone just goes about their business no one's gonna put in the effort to kind of check on yeah. you or yeah or do these social cues that are our norm but i, I would argue that's kind of a good thing i think yeah. that we treat each other as long as it's genuine and it's not like fake yeah i, I think it's an it, it's a it's part of american culture respect. Exactly. Yeah. The mutual yeah. respect that I, I'm proud of that. Uh, I'm super proud of it, but just the difference there in cultures and people coming to the United States and the, are you bringing back where you were like, where you came from and then trying to apply it or are you trying to adjust to, um, American culture? What's the term for that when you're assimilation assimilation? Yeah. Yeah. I believe that's it. Right. Cause that's a big challenge too. I think even in like France right now with, different parts of Europe and Middle Eastern cultures kind of developing different like cities and ghettos. And um, they're having a bunch of policy issues over there too, just trying to deal with all these different ways of living and their perspective in the world. But um, Tony, so your family history coming from Mexico, what's that timeline like? Was it your great grandparents that? So it would be my grandparents were the first ones to come here. Okay. Like my great grandparents um for the most part just stayed lived over there mm -hmm. um it started with i would say more my dad's side of the family because on my mom's side they came a little later um it started around 
early 70s or so. I'd say probably the turn of the, yeah, about like 1970. Uh, my grandpa would go over there and he worked. Um, he, he didn't get a visa. They basically just crossed. Mm -hmm. um, it, the border wasn't as like protected as it is now. Um, it was easier to cross back then. Um, he did basically, um, he worked on the fields with like picking apples and everything like that. Um, just trying to get, find whatever he can do to make money to bring back home. Um, and then my grandma, she stayed home with all her kids. She had my oldest uncle who he was probably four at the time. And then my dad was only, my dad was next and he was about a year old. And then I had uh, my next uncle. He was like barely, he was a couple months. Um, so three kids at this point? Three kids at the and point, yeah. Um, and so my grandma was basically by herself taking care of them. She had the help of her mom, uh, my great grandma. And um, at one point they couldn't support feeding my dad and my uncles. Um, it was hard to come by with food because they lived in a ranch. It was just like they were in the middle of nowhere. It took them a while. My grandma didn't know how to drive, so they really didn't have access to go to the nearest town, get food, water. Um, they would have to go to a, a river, like a stream, and use buckets to get water, bring it back home, and then fill like a small little reservoir. Mm -hmm. um, so it was hard on them. It was really hard. That's why my grandpa went over there. Uh, Cause it, like, so just, did you ever talk to him about what his perspective was, was like that land of opportunity right there, like almost in arm's length of why this is my family who I loved mm -hmm. so dearly. Why am I not going to attempt yeah. to get over there, whether it's legal or, or not legal? You so know? I didn't really get, cause I'm not as good as like in speaking Spanish so, cause I would always speak to my parents English. Mm -hmm. So my Spanish isn't all there. And my grandpa was just pure Spanish. He didn't really speak English too well. So there was that language barrier between each other, me and him. And I would ask him, he would tell me some stories, but then there's a lot of words he would say that I'm just like, what is that? What is that? What does that mean? What does that mean? Did your parents ever provide perspective on what he was saying? Yeah, they would tell me. Usually I got most of the stories through my parents. Mm -hmm. So I really didn't know what was going on with like through my grandpa's head when he was over there. All I knew is that he was doing his best to give them money so they can buy food, they can buy clothes um, and just survive basically. Uh, my dad almost died of malnourishment. He didn't have enough food. Um, uh, my grandma wasn't eating properly so it was hard for her to breastfeed. And then my my dad's uncle, which is my grandma's brother, stepped in and helped out. He was working at the time. My grandma wasn't working. She was taking care of the kids. And he would bring, um, like, uh, he would bring milk for my dad and my, my uncles. That's how they would survive, basically off milk, tortillas. Um, and that's it. They wouldn't even eat, like, meat. It was just, like, tortillas, bread, and milk. Um a lot of poor people back then would survive off a Coke and bread. It would just fill you up and all you sugar, have. Yeah, yeah. It's a sugar. Yeah. It's crazy. So, so your grandpa's going back and forth sending money or is he, no, he's like, I like wiring it. I don't okay. know how, yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. how, yeah, he would never come back. He, he was always staying there just making the money. So how did he get the whole family to follow and where did you guys so settle? He, he was there for about three years. And wh where is this specifically? Uh, Central California. Okay. So, yeah, all there. And then um, he moved. I don't. I think he got a job in like a like machining. It was like making metal parts for like airplanes and stuff. And then it was in Long Beach. I think the company was called AMF American Machining. I don't know the last one, but so he got a. He was working there in Long Beach. He loved the area. Um, and then that's when he told, he actually went back and he told them, hey, we got to come back here. And so he was just there for about a week and he went back by himself. And my grandma and my youngest uncle, who was just like months old, they went 
and they they flew. So they flew over to LAX. And then from there, they they went to Long Beach and they live with my grandpa. And then my dad and my older uncle were still in Mexico. Um, they were getting taken care of by my great grandma for like another year or so. Um, and and so then they would have been like still under 10 years old. Oh, yeah. Or, okay. Yeah. My dad was probably at that time. He was already like three, maybe four because he came when he was five. Yeah, so he was about four. And then my older uncle was like seven. Um, okay. And then they crossed. They had the hardest way. Cro- they crossed through the river. No way. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, they, they crossed through the river. Um, my how, uncle I'm made sorry, it. How old were they when so they did this? Seven. No, eight and five because my dad came here when he was five. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, who so was the adult? It was the his cousin who was about. I'd say maybe 15 years old. He, at the time, he was like 20, 21. Um, and then they had another person helping them out. I don't think they had a relation with them. And then uh, so they were crossing. And at that point, my dad was struggling. He couldn't. I mean, he was only five. He couldn't really swim the current. So he was, in a sense, kind of drowning. And then my uh, his uncle, or no, his cousin, I mean, he went and put him on his shoulders and then there, he was kind of like swimming while my dad was just holding onto his head. Um, it wasn't that big of a river. It was maybe like 200 feet wide. But it, it was a really strong current, and it was about 10 feet deep maybe. Um, I mean, at five, that I can imagine. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. got to shake remem- you. That's, I mean, yeah, and then that's he still insane. Remem- that's crazy. He still remembers that because, I mean, it was traumatizing to him. Mm-hmm. I can't remember a lot of things when I was five, but he remembers that. And... I remember he was only able to supposed to bring like whatever he can grab from the house. So everything they left over there, um, he brought his favorite little boots, little cowboy boots, um, just a t-shirt and some, some pants. So they make it across and Mm -hmm. how do they, do they reconnect with your grandpa and so they get, yeah, they, they make it across and then they get picked up. The guy that's helping them already had like a ride. Mm -hmm. So they get picked up and then they just, Travel, um, they crossed from TJ, like that area. I think it was more Mexicali, so it was like more inland. And then um, from there, they just drove all the way up to Long Beach, like three hour drive or so. Um, and then that's how they reconnected with my grandparents. And Incredible. yeah, and the thing is, my dad wasn't afraid that he almost drowned. He would always tell me, he's like, what? What got me upset is I lost one of my boots. Oh, no. Yeah, like it, the current took it, and he only had one shoe. He's like, no, my boot. Like, he wanted to get back in to get it. Wow. And then, yeah, they're like, no, no, come. So they went, um, they got picked up by the van, and they went all the way. So now your your grandfather, or your great-grandpa, um, is working at a, a mill? Oh, no, it no, would have been your grandpa, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So your grandpa's working at a mill, and now mm-hmm. is he, so now he's raising a family in America, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're, they're living with, um, I think he had a brother that got him the job there cause his brother was already kind of living in the U S. Mm-hmm. Um, so he got help from them and they all lived in a small little house. I think it was like a two bedroom house, about 10, 10, 11 people. Um, my grandpa and grandma had to share just one room with those five of them, a little room, probably this size. Um, so I don't know how they did it. They were just for about five years or so. And then they were able to save enough money to get like their own little place that they actually live in to this day. My, my grandma still lives at that. Incredible. Yeah. So um, my brain's kind of going in two different areas and it's, it's prevalent now because people hear your story mm-hmm. and instead of it being like a surface level news headline or people being so quick to judge people coming into the country illegally. You hear something like that and it kind of opens up your ability to see it in a different light, like the struggle, the the yeah. malnourishment, the not even be able to breastfeed your child because you don't like that. If that doesn't make you assess the problem a little differently, then you're not a good human being. Like that's just point blank. I'll say that. Like if you can't take in that data that these, these families have to deal with, like I was just born here, mm-hmm. so I never 
had to deal with that. Of course, we face struggles in different capacities, but so that side, I'm thinking of that. And then along the same lines, the reality of any system which has a capacity issue, whether it's taxes, whether it's Mm -hmm. schooling system, whether it's people's, uh, they're talking about levels of fairness, like, because that's all a common thing people throw around. It's like, oh, they're not paying their taxes, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So what I'm getting at is balancing <laughs> the reality of malnourishment, let's say, to make it specific. That reality in some families right over the border where if I was in their shoes, the, the promised land, the land of opportunity, literally over the hill. So you don't have to go across the big pond. It's it's literally right there. Yeah. Of course I'm going to go over. But how do we balance it out to hopefully build a system which can process people legally to facilitate that better life? I think that's where the question lies is if if you realize that there's struggle happening, like how do we build something that is going to have a capacity, you know? There's going to be people that are turned away and that's so unfortunate and I of course want to help as many people as possible any good person would and I think that's where we need to focus in like solving and talking about this problem is the reality of the story you just described yeah with the reality of luck and chance like there's some people born in a hut in the middle of Africa who I mean arguably I know people like oh the iPhone doesn't make your life better or Blah, blah, blah. I, I get that, but let's just baseline like medical, the medical system, mm-hmm. the, the ability to take care of yourself. Just being born on this land as an American, you're already blessed with so many things that other people mm-hmm. don't get to see. So by virtue of your grandpa starting this better life for his family, for his offspring, now you are just born, pure... T- yeah. You're just born. You're here. I could have been born over there. and You're here yeah. based on their decisions. And think about the opportunities that come with that too, right? Like you yeah. were just saying. And, and the mindset. Or we were even talking a little bit about your work and how you were saying that, you know, I don't know if I'm going to stick with it forever because like it's going to maybe hurt my back a little bit or it's going to yeah. hinder me. And Just those opportunities to make now free decisions in the United States, all based just this real recent trickle effect from the seventies like that. That's what fascinates me. And I think in solving those issues, you have to weigh and measure like the reality of a system and a capacity and laws and having borders, which I mean, since like the beginning of time, we've had different cultures have different ideas of borders. And I think like native Americans, for example, didn't know what, like owning land was Mm -hmm. like the idea of like fencing in land, but that was like common in Europe. But what I'm getting at is like, just you're here now and and you're blessed. And like, we all have these different ways of looking at it, but what, what ended up happening? um, So everyone settles in long beach. Yeah. And did your dad start assimilating into like elementary school and high school? And then, so How did he, through his experiences, what did he like kind of pass on to you? So um, they didn't start school right away. Um, they didn't know like what to do to get him enrolled. But my dad's uncle, my grandpa's brother, had ki- children in school already. And he, he basically helped them enroll. So all three of my uncles went to school, elementary school. My dad started, I think... Uh, First grade, he started first grade, had the language barrier where he he didn't know any English. Mm -hmm. So it was a little hard for him. Um, He said he got really easy, though, because just listening and the the teacher he had was very um, helpful. She focused a lot on him uh, where she was teaching him basic words. Yes, no. Um please, thank you. And he picked up on it pretty quickly. Within a year or two, he was already speaking pretty fluently. Um, He brought it home. And there, basically him and his brothers were speaking English to each other at that point. 
Um, they would speak a lot of Spanish, of course, to my grandparents. So that was easy for him. Um, they were going to school for most of elementary school. And then um, my uncle started working. I don't think he even graduated. Um, he didn't even pass on to middle school. My oldest uncle, he had to work. Um, they were elementary school to work. Yeah, because my grandma, Gnarly. Um, she was barely making any money, minimum wage. My grandpa was barely making any money. Um, and so they couldn't afford where they were living. They couldn't even afford a little apartment. Uh, it was a two-bedroom apartment. Um, so my uncle needed to step in for that extra income. And then my dad started working at 13. He was still going to school, but he found it a little too hard to balance going to school in the day and then working full-time. He worked at his first job was like a Chinese restaurant. He was um, like a busser. He was just washing all the dishes, everything at 13 years old. And he couldn't balance it. He was tired. He wouldn't, sometimes he wouldn't wake up early for school. He'd be late. So he'd be like, you know, what? I'm not going to school. Um, so, I mean, that's got to, it's shaping his experience dealing with all those things at such a young age. Yeah. So in modern times now, them going through their en entire lives, having you and, what has your perspective been shaped into dealing with all of the, the challenges we face now at, at the border? And like, do you, when you see people trying to come in, like you've literally heard from your own family experience, the idea mm -hmm. of like going to that better life yeah, and like people, I mean, just, yeah, directly, like what, what is your perspective like on that situation? It's kind of like, it is what it is, or you wish we could um, just let everyone in or. I, there's just, I think there's a huge challenge on that because you can't just let everyone in, you know, um, you have to have tabs on it, everything. Mm -hmm. Um, like the taxes, you know, how they say, Oh, illegals don't pay taxes. They do in a sense where, um, they're paying income tax. They're getting taxed. Uh, they're paying basically general tax when they're buying things. Um, and I think, uh, so yeah, we don't even... Yeah, I just, I don't, I mean, I don't understand now. I knew back then it was much easier. I think now is a little harder. I have a friend that doesn't have papers and he's lived here his whole life. Yeah. He was born in Mexico and he came here when he was like not even one. And he graduated high school and he can't get his papers. He said it's too difficult. Um, so that's, I, I've thought of that before too in like different capacity issues. So like if you have... X amount of people coming from, let's say, Scotland in 2020. Mm -hmm. I imagine that number is a fraction of people trying to come in from Mexico, which is like just by virtue of it being so close geographically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, that's and why people just attempt to go over because it's like right there. The other question that it always makes me bring up, and, you know, something I'm excited to dig into a little bit more is going through that process with my family. Just wondering, like, how, you know, in, a, in I guess, a kind of general sense, like, how it's even possible in today's day. Yeah. Because every single part of the process that we went through in order to become Americans was needing to fill out all of this paperwork. Or even the ability to get anything done. Get a driver's license, buy a home, buy a car, buy anything. Get a credit card. Like, you needed so much documentation that was only obtainable through going through that process. So I've just always kind of wondered, you know, what, how exactly, and like you said, back, you know, maybe 30, 40 years ago, it was easier, Yeah. but just kind of wondering, you know, where that comes from. And, you know, it was also interesting hearing you talk about, you know, once your family got here, that your, your dad having to work and your family having to work basically as soon yeah. as possible. My, my dad growing up, also started working from, I think he was eight when he got his first job, wow. um, just to put food on the table for his family. You know, he, they would literally have like sandwiches that were just like bread and sugar just to get by. And, um, he's told me stories before where like he would wake up in the model in the morning to like deliver milk bottles and like it being so cold in Scotland that like the milk bottles were like freezing to his fingers and he like couldn't oh, like wow. get them off and like had to like rip them off. 
But that was while they were still in that environment, you know, mm -hmm. to hear you say that that was still your family's experience when you s they moved here. I thought that was, you know, very, very interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. I, it, I think it was easier because for the, I, back then, because Ronald Reagan passed like a bill where you just had to sign paperwork and live. I think Can you pull that up, Grant, the Ronald. I think it's on that graph that we were looking at. It was in Is that the 60s? No. So you could probably Reagan's just look in the up. 80s. Yeah. yeah, Reagan passed. Cuz my parents got their papers. They're already um I think my dad was in his early 20s. My mom was in her early 20s. That's when they got their citizenship. Mm -hmm. And then my grandparents got it around the same time as well. Like everybody just got it at that time. Um how how did they feel like when they finally got their citizenship? Did they ever tell you? No, I think for them it was like um, it wasn't too big of a process where getting it made it like such a relief. Oh, no, like because they already were established. They lived on their own. Um, my parents married young. My dad was only 18. My mom was 20. And so they're already established, had their own thing. It's just they needed that extra step to just make them citizens um, all they had to do was fill out some paperwork, send it in, show that they, they lived here uh, for a certain amount of time. I think it was 10 years maybe. Um, and so then they got the process to take the test. I think they got a form in so they can take the test. They took the test and then they were citizens like right away. I think now wow. it's such a bigger process. It takes years and years and now you need lawyers for that yep. and. Yeah, um, it's, yeah uh, what was it like for you, Scott? Didn't it take like eight-ish years? To get my actual citizenship? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there was a process there. But even getting the visa to get into the country was, uh, I would say, an even more extensive process. You know, I think that sometimes the thought process can be that, you know, if you're coming from Europe, right, if you're an immigrant from Europe, that they're basically just going to let anyone in. But that's very much not the case. Essentially, if you don't have family here already or a job lined up in advance that are going to help you mm -hmm. with the lawyers and all that process, then you're not going to get in. It's not as easy as just booking a ticket to like, you know, the U S and <laughs> all right, see you later. So there was so many different stages on that extensive background checks on my parents and us as kids too, which is crazy. Um, all these different prove, uh, uh, like different ways to prove that my dad had a job lined up once he got here. The biggest part of the process was um, actually having to travel to London from Kilmarnock to for a one-time scheduled appointment at the U.S. Embassy to review all the paperwork and get the stamp on that work visa. So my parents, like, had to figure a way to, like, get down there. They left us in Kilmarnock and flew down there in 2005. And I'll never forget this because they've told me the story so many times, but they were actually in the U.S. Embassy in London during the London bombings in 2005. So like oh, wow. they're in they're in the physical embassy, like getting their paperwork to move to America finally after like months and months of this super strenuous process. And then the bombs start going off in the subway. And like I remember them telling me that like all of a sudden things got super tense and then everyone, all the tellers that were working the booths like disappeared. And they were like, oh no, like are we is someone attacking the embassy? Oh my god. Yeah. Gosh. So it was unbelievable. And then when we moved back in 2007, they had to start that entire process over again to attain another visa. So all of the paperwork, all of the interviews, going back down to London again, like just having to make that all work was such a strenuous process. Um, and then actually becoming a citizen, I was the only one in my family that chose to become a citizen. They all extended their green cards. So my, my family are who are here are still UK, uh, uh, their nationality is still the United Kingdom. Uh, but that process was pretty crazy. Um, the, the final part that I think it's the N 400 form that took me like a year and some change to get done. And there were so many different documents and background checks. And then the day that I finally thought it was going to happen where I was going to get my citizenship and take the oath, they told me that I couldn't do it because, uh, like I didn't have one tax form from my dad from like 2012. So like not even like near either of the times that we moved here, like just, it's such a, a, a drag of a process that like I was on the phone to my parents and they're like digging through all of their documents to find this like one tax no form from like well, years ago. So when was this? 
like this process? No. When when was this? When you were trying to look for the form and what? Oh, like at the beginning of this year. Dang. Yeah. So I went to the embassy or the embassy. I went to the custom and immigration offices in Santa Ana in like January, and it like added another like two months to the process after living here for like the better part of thirteen years and going through this process. Incredible. But then yeah. you were granted it, right? And recently. Yes, sir. March thirtieth. March 30th. Yeah, wow. big day. Uh, that was a huge day for the family because, like I said, I'm the only one that chose to go through that process. So then it goes back to what we we're talking about earlier, right? Where, like, my dad's family, like, 99% Scottish, right? And I'm the one that, like, got out. And now from, like, me, like, this point onwards, like, my kids are going to be American. And it's a <laughs> huge, so huge crazy. deal. So, uh, yeah, we were very excited about that. Dude, well, congratulations Thank for you. getting it. Thank I know you. how stoked you were. When yeah, it yeah, it was a big deal. Like but, I said, you know, just to, to be from small town Kilmarnock and be the one that is like able to come here and like all the opportunities that's presented for not just myself, but my family. It was, uh, yeah, it was a big deal. So, you know, firsthand experience of how challenging it actually is. Yeah. Because when yeah. you were bringing up all this paperwork and whatnot, I'm thinking of like folks from all around the world or even south of the border, yeah. do they even have access to a printer? Like, do they? <laughs> yeah, like, that's <laughs> the thing that, that's why I was wondering, like, like that right. process is just, it's so intense. Like uh, there, there's a whole other part of the process where like you have to find like a place to stay while you're here before you can even get the visa. So you have to have something put together. But my parents didn't have a credit card in the US. They had no credit. So they didn't have a way to like buy a house or like mm -hmm. even like lease something. So I think the way that it worked out is my dad was just fortunate enough to have a good job lined up where like the company paid the lease and then took it out of my dad's salary. So it's like, it gets to that point and you were talking about like lawyers and immigration lawyers. There's so many steps where like we were the beneficiaries of like my dad just being fortunate enough to like get a good job here, you know, where it's like that process would have been hindered so many times if we just wanted to, you know, come here for the opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. Just kind of show up without a job or just, yeah. And I, think, well, I, yeah, go, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and I think that's why people are coming here illegally because it's just way too hard to even get into America. And everyone says it's a land of opportunity. That's the first, when people want to leave their country, what's the first country they think of? Usually, usually it's the U S they want to come here because of all the opportunity they can to find, to make a better living to build their own business, um, to provide for their children and just have them have a better place to live in than back home where you can't find water, you're barely eating, barely surviving. Yeah. Yeah. So and and so that thought is, process doesn't even just come from sharing a border with the U.S. Or either. Like you mentioned, you know, it's the first place everyone thinks of. Thinks of. It's the yeah. exact same in Kilmarnock, you know. Really? It really is the land of opportunity. And that is something that we've all heard so many times, right? You know? So, uh, Tony, how has yeah. your family grappled with the challenges as of late? Just knowing that, like, we were fortunate enough to come over at this certain time. Do they, do I'm, I imagine they feel for some of the people that are trying to get over or being held up at the border? Yeah, like the children in cages and everything like that. I mean, yeah. um, they, they're fortunate enough not to be in that situation where they came, where it was easier to get into the U.S., where it was easier to get your citizenship. Um, they're not really um, looking at the news too much, mm -hmm. so they don't see what's going on current events. Um, but if if they were ingrained and focused on everything that's going on, they would, yeah, they would see like how much better it was back then to come over here yeah but did they so this brings up the idea of like the belief in america because it's it's definitely being challenged nowadays when you bring up like the kids in cages and these mm -hmm. really terrible sites that a lot of citizens now see and then they start to question whether like they're proud to be an american and um does the flag represent everyone or like these people in power, are they suppressing it? Are these systems just so corrupt where it leads to like, that's how you're processing yeah. these little kids is th this is the system that we created. It's uh, but I wanted to bring that up just because how did they shape 
your perspective? Like, what's your true perspective of, uh, America? of America? With just knowing that there's all of this chaos going on and these different challenges we're trying to figure out together, and then you see people condemning America, like, and, um, and then also people kind of on the brash side, like, oh, they shouldn't have tried to cross the border. Like, that's why they're there. You know, there's just ex extremes. But I just want to, from your family story, because it's, of course, not how mine was, I want to know what you think. I mean, I still think it's a land of opportunity. Uh, I came right now between us three. Hey, let's start a business. Let's make our way of living and, you know, get an LLC and everything like that. That you can't do anywhere else. Um, I mean, yeah, but like in poor countries, you can't really do that. You literally have to just survive on just finding food, whatever, doing just hard labor. Um, I still think it's a land of opportunity. I think our government's a little corrupt. Uh, it's just a two party system and no one tries to break from that. I think it's just either de you're either Democrat, or you're Republican. Um, that's true. And it kind of yeah. manifests in so many complicated ways, even with, let's just focus on South of the border right now. And when, when people are, are trying to come across. And of course there was so many talks of the border wall that the Trump administration built, uh, the, f the functionality in comparison to just the, the visual representation of what a giant wall means. I don't really know. I don't know how functional it actually is. If people are still finding different ways to get across. But nonetheless, government is in charge of developing these systems that are supposed to deal with these problems. And the, I imagine that in the best way they can, like there's, there's people there trying to do their jobs, whether it's like border yeah. patrol, which was, I forget exactly which year it was created, but it's just, it's such a challenging problem. Like you, how do you deal with an influx of people who just want to literally go to a, a better life. Like they're trying to get across the border and they're not like even that. It's the, they're all like to bring it to that perspective worldwide. Like you were saying in Scotland and in Mexico and mm -hmm. probably everywhere. America now has built over time, this idea of that land of opportunity and people want to be here. Mm -hmm. And it's just so, because we can't accept everybody but then good people don't want to turn away little kids or by God, by me putting them in cages or whatever. It's yeah. We it's, can all agree. That's not the solution, yeah. right? Either way. Yeah. D did your parents Scott shape your idea of America at all? I know you already talked about it a little bit, but what's, I'll give what's you, your belief? Yeah. Cause you literally were just granted citizenship and you mentioned taking this oath. What was, yeah. What yeah. That oath? was a big deal. The, the, you know, the, the oath ceremony is the final part that, the, the, the the, the real moment where, you know, you get the handshake and you, you put the hand on the heart and, you know, you talk about, you know, being faithful to America. Um, I was willing to take that based on, you know, my belief in America and my idea of America. And I think that definitely comes from my family. It comes from my parents and them being able to provide us the opportunities. But I'll give you kind of the example that I think of. It's my sister, Vicky. Have you had the chance to meet my sister? I not, no. So I have two sisters, um, uh, Vicky uh, has special needs. She has chromosome 16 disorder, which is a, I would guess you'd say like a more mild form of down syndrome. Uh, she's pretty high functioning, but, um, is like definitely like, wouldn't be able to engage in like a normal curriculum at like school, for example. Right. So growing up in Scotland, we had, you know, the school system as is, and then there was a special needs school, but Vicky was kind of in this weird middle space where she was like too high functioning to go to like a special needs school. And my parents obviously wanted to give her the most normal life possible. Right. Um, but that was just really difficult to do in Kilmarnock at that time. So I always recall a story from when we went back that second stint in Kilmarnock was two years before we moved to Texas. And I remember a teacher being told for Vicky to just sit her in the corner of the room and give her word searches to do, crossword puzzles, things like that. Nothing to do with like the regular curriculum. Just like sit her in the corner and find something to keep her busy, right? Um, and I remember even in that first stint when I was literally like six, seven years old, like 
standing up for my sister because like people were like making fun of her for having special needs like as a kid and like telling her that she like belongs in the special needs school and all that kind of stuff just horrible things um and the solution in Kilmarnock at that time like w- what do you do you just got to work with the teachers that are good to her and like give her as many opportunities as you can then transition that to coming to the U.S. and like there's people who are like designated to making sure that Vicky gets the care that she needs and the education that she needs. And it was just such an eye opening experience for me to see that the opportunities that she got completely changed her life for the better. Since then she's graduated high school and a curriculum that worked for her. That was this kind of hybrid between special needs classes and the regular curriculum, right? For lack of a better phrase. And since then she's, um, she's like worked at like kindergartens. She's worked in hotels. She's worked for like a like a production and manufacturing company. She's had all of these amazing jobs and opportunities that like quite literally would have just never been presented to her. This is the same girl that got told to just sit in the corner and do crossword puzzles. And, and when I think of Vicky in particular, I, I, that is what shapes my belief in America. Right? That 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 opportunities that are presented to her because she's physically here and for no other reason have allowed her to achieve a life that was n- inconceivable back home. That's heavy, man. That's incredible. Cause it's just another subset of American innovation too. Like whether it's manufacturing, whether it's government, whether it's trying to design the best roads, what, whatever mm-hmm. the system may be bringing this down to a level in the school the reality is we have certain individuals that need special care. What can we do? What system can we make? What employ the people that we employ now, people are special like specialists in in helping people like Vicky, mm-hmm. which is incredible. So that's that just goes to show that in as imperfect as America is, like that system was the result of of that American idea of like, let's, let's take care of our people. You know, like we're not going to just go sit them in the corner. It's we've invested time in developing so many different ways to help people in different capacities. And it's not perfect by any means, whether you're talking about vets, uh, whether you're talking about road systems that are kind of shitty because the government isn't doing a proper job of allocating funds and, Mm -hmm. and building it. But nonetheless, I think just that system there that allows people to be taken care of. And of course, people would argue like, well, wait, but you have to be an American citizen then at that point. And I would say like the reality is the harsh reality is so people, let's say that are trying to get to the U S that want that level of care, but can't, and they can see it there. They know it exists, but you still have to go through the system in order to receive it. Mm -hmm. That's, It's kind of sad. I get it, but it just comes back to the ideas of borders and and the system that was built only being able to facilitate uh, like a certain level of people, you know? I mean, every country has borders. Every country has their own way to get their citizenship as Mm -hmm. well. That's a good point. It's not inherently like an American problem. Yeah. And it hasn't been for hundreds of years. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like America always gets the criticism of it because everyone's trying to go there and it's like they can only handle so much people coming in i also think that part of it to take it kind of in another direction but definitely related a a cynic could kind of hear the story that you know i i I mentioned about vicky and and say something along the lines of like you, you know you talk about room for improvement right And there's always room for improvement and i've even had moments where i've thought about you know programs not being the best for her um and that, that being like, okay, well, wh- why isn't it? And it's like, oh, because like, you know, it's not easy to profit from that, right? From a, ca- like from like a, from a capitalist standpoint, right? But I, I, I think that to take that in a different direction, you know, I, it's important to just remember that like, that's not even available everywhere. And I, I wish it was, you know, the, the real land of opportunity thought process there. Because um, there is room for improvement. You're right. Absolutely. And it's, it's the perspective of, when you're a multi-generational American and we we're seeing this recently and people talk about the theory of there's really not so 
there's not so many problems and there's not so much turmoil and challenges in people's lives Mm -hmm. that now we're getting more granular and where we're trying to nitpick and problem solve and like virtue signal here or cancel here. It's we're trying to find problems that exist, but don't really exist because we have food on the table because we have these comfortable Mm -hmm. roads to, to drive on because we have this healthcare system, which is good because there's always room for improvement. I don't think, by definition of getting more granular with problem solving and trying to fix little corruptions in society, like that's that's a good thing. Yeah, I don't think being pessimistic about those things is necessarily the best thing. And and you know, there's a there's a, a, a ne- there is a benefit to it in a sense that you know things always get better over time, right? But that's yeah. the idea that you know it will continue to improve and those things will continue to come together. But yeah, like you said, you know, nitpicking and things, I I, I don't see necessarily the benefit in that. No. But there's, I really think there's strength and diversity too. And maybe that kind of ties into what you were saying earlier, just about Americans being nice to each other. Mm -hmm. But to get down to a level of just by virtue of being a child born and raised in America and growing up and seeing different kinds of people, different hues of color, different nationalities, different races, different uh, lingos, ways of speaking... And kind of just being exposed to that, I think, molds someone's mind into more of a, like, accepting worldview. And, of course, you have your different perspectives that are, like, hard-headed within your family that might combat that. But just by virtue of knowing that, like, you're an American and you can, and it's oftentimes in, like, cities and whatnot, too. There's a lot of people, like, out on the farmland or you're in different parts of rural America that maybe won't get that same diversity. But for me, for example, being born and raised in Orange County, just I, I've i always kind of taken note of that, not particularly when you're little, like, you're not thinking in, in the those terms, but now I know as I've gone older, it's had a positive impact on me just because you're a little bit more well-rounded in how you see different types of people. Like I'm not so quick to judge. Yeah. You know, there's There's some people on earth who have never seen a white person. There's some people on earth that have like never seen a black person. That's just the realities. And that to manifest in America, the strength and diversity I think is powerful because we are that land where there's just so many different types of people here. And yeah. then they're all interracial and mm-hmm. everyone's mixed. So it's like you have a little bit of everything in you. Exactly. But then there's challenges that come along with it because yeah. people are territorial. People are tribal. I think um, some people naturally lean towards what's defined as like racist. Just that idea of something different like the other. Like if you were a roaring tribe back in the day and – another tribe came over the hill and it was like the other, like what are they coming to take from me? You know, that, that type of idea, I still, it exists in our, our brains. Like whether we think about it a lot or not, if you're in a a city or if there's just people that are so used to being with their kind in air quotes, because that's how people think we're all human beings. And I hope that we get, to a point where we can all just see each other as as fellow human beings, no matter what color we are. But nonetheless, people get into their cliques and they're used to their environment. Like, yeah. So then you are, you're programmed to kind of think about the other. And because there's so many different types of people in the United States, I think that psychological process happens a lot in comparison to rural parts of Slovakia or even Scotland or just different parts all over the world where you're just used to seeing your people in air quotes. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting that you brought up the idea of like the tribe mentality in that sense, because even though, like I mentioned earlier, Scotland is overwhelmingly white. um, There's still that tribal kind of sense, but between white people in this, in the views of Protestants versus Catholics, you know, like that, that I would agree with you that it's, that comes from a different, that same kind of place, even though it has nothing to do with skin color, you know? And I think it's interesting that it's here because America is a powerhouse, like the world has never seen before in a time frame that's never happened before. 
And that comes from immigrants. That comes from people moving here and being able to, you know, build up this amazing country so quickly. Yeah, the premise of not only the promised land, but I'm going to go there and it's freedom to innovate. Yeah. And just all of these different kinds of people come from different parts of the world. I think that's the strength and diversity of like, even if you take it to a, a team within a company, any sort of uh, business venture, you, f- you often find strength in teams and like yeah. not trying to wear too many hats, but having a diverse team with experts in different areas. I think having so many different types of people gives us that strength. We have the armor to be like, we're diverse and, I, I really believe in that idea. I, I like it, you know, but there's challenges. There's challenges that come with it, right? There's so yeah. many challenges that come with it. You know, I, I'm hopeful even amongst all of the turmoil and uh, people being so quick to judge as of late. I think, I think we're heading in the right direction just because these problems are kind of surfacing and we're going to be able to work our way through them. And over time, I think people, that's one of the benefits of like social media and technology yeah. too, is you're exposed it, to different walks yeah. of life and different cultures. And that of course will have its unintended consequences too. And it's, <laughs> it's pitfalls. But what were you going to say, Tony? That no, I was going to say that, that um, before social media, before all this stuff, people weren't as exposed what's going on throughout like the U S or over different parts of the world. Now that there's more, we can connect with someone across the world and know what's going on in their lives. We see um, just a difference of, in their everything. And I think people are getting more, um, they're not just in their own little world. Their perspective is yeah, they're broadening. Just, they're, yeah, they're opening up more and it's becoming more diverse. Uh, I feel like racism is slowly going away it will never go away but it's not as it how it was before and just like, keeps dwindling down people are being more accepted accepting so and I would that's agree. all due to social media also people getting canceled because of that because because of social media so a lot of people but people can hold that in they could still be racist just not show it because of social media um that's true yeah, Th- there's so a lot of know. closet racists. Yeah, as you my dad know. would put it, and that's an argument a lot of people made for the Trump presidency is he he gave the ability for these closet racists in air quotes to kind of come out and show their true colors a little bit more, which is unfortunate because that by no means is his total support group and the people that. It, like like him as a leader mm-hmm. they're not all racist but those closet racists that come out now their ideology and perspective gets applied to the whole group in reality you have to treat it on an individual level and yeah and assess everyone's opinion but that's that's it's challenging for humans to think that way i i, I think well it's, it's uh, things are always thought about in a blanket statement you're either this or this right yeah. and i think that when you get to the conversation about, you know, to take it back to border security and things of that nature, I wouldn't necessarily call it like inherently racist to, you know, care about those policies or have an opinion on those policies. Right. And I think that the Trump Mm -hmm. presidency, you know, made that almost more divisive in that sense. Right. Where it was like, because he is poor at articulating a strong sense of border security, then he gives the opportunity for people who are actually racist to like, come out and you know wave their their that flag proudly for lack of a better exactly face. and the pendulum swings and we're we had that presidency and we our current administration there's been a bunch of turmoil i think around uh, vice president harris not getting to the border in time to mm-hmm. kind of boots on the ground the people want to see our leaders kind of showing face and trying to solve these issues and then people are saying oh she didn't even when she finally did go she didn't even actually go to the area mm-hmm. which was the the most tur- like the most turmoil was happening she went somewhere like a thousand miles away kids are still in cages too yeah god that's i couldn't imagine i can't believe yeah. that i honestly that's you crazy. know there's there's i don't think there's any person that thinks that that's the solution 
So why is it still happening, you know, regardless of who's in charge? That needs to get fixed immediately. Do you think it's like to make a statement? Like um like you want to come over here I just think trying to stop the wave of people coming in because they're not just coming from Mexico through the south. Mm -hmm. It's people from like uh, El Salvador and all those like Central American mm -hmm. countries, even some South American countries just going through Mexico. And even in Mexico, there's racism to them. There's a lot of Mexicans that are racist to those people like, hey, what are you doing here? Go home. Why are you here? It's every it's not just America. It's Mexico as well. There's a lot of countries that are that way. Um, and see, that's important to bring up because it ties into the idea of like racism and the idea of the other. And even though it doesn't make it okay, humans treat each other like that. Yeah. Like even if you're the same color, but you're from a different part of Central America or Mexico, you're still the other. Like you're not us. This is our little tribe. That's Get out of here. You're going to mess things up. That's what I was talking and about with the religion thing earlier in Scotland, too. That's another example. Same skin color, but then that, that tribal mindset of being like, well, no, you are the other. So, And exactly, and not to say that it's okay, but take that to the American experiment now where you have people of all different colors from all different parts of the world. Now that's going to be complicated because you're going to have all these people kind of and all we've been growing. Yeah. Religions. All these people pointing the finger and yeah. like, oh, that's the other. But I believe what you said, Tony, is that we're moving further away from that. There's still racist people that exist. Mm -hmm. And there's still people that don't want immigrants here at all. And like, this is our land. Like, get out of here. But I think we're slowly trickling to that more worldview and understanding of like immigration's a thing. People try since the beginning of time to move to a better life. Uh, yeah. Like and everybody came from your family came from Europe back or your mom's side came from the 1600s. Your dad came exactly. later. And so everyone came from a different part of the world. Um, only true Americans are like the native Americans that have been here mm -hmm. since. And they came the from the, the, what is it? The Iberian, the Siberian peninsula when it, the, Ice was frozen, and mm -hmm. they were able. Yeah, they to, crossed through Russia, and and they um, were able to populate the entire continent. Yeah. So, and then part of like California, Arizona, uh, Nevada, all that was Mexico. They didn't. They didn't care about the land. U.S. just bought it off them. But. Yep. So, do you guys believe in like the future of America? Do you think we're going to be all right with, even with all the turmoil and immigration policy and. You think eventually we'll all get along and racism will be pretty much extinguished? And I, I definitely think that things are moving in the right direction. And I think yeah. that, you know, maybe I'm just an optimistic person in general, right? But it goes back to something that's been a common touch point during this whole conversation, right? There's always going to be room for improvement, right? And... I mentioned it kind of briefly earlier too, but I think it plays into the idea that we always look back on ourselves and we're like, I can't believe that's where we were. And that throughout America's history has been the conversation. And I think that more than anything and the experiences that I've had through my own experience make me optimistic about the future of this country, which is why I decided to become a citizen. So there you go. Yeah, and then like government's becoming more diverse. So people from different backgrounds are getting into politics and they are applying what they went through. Mm -hmm. So like they know the hardships they, their family's gone through. So they apply policies to better what's going on. Like someone can apply something to help those kids in cages. Um, and then we just got to hope that people are not corrupt to the core because even in a diverse government if we're moving closer and closer to that idea of people like to loosely throw out the term socialism but just that instead of being closed borders hard-headed we're going to take care of our own people just getting so open and accepting to where it does become some social socialistic like nature government to where is could that be a potential downfall just like being too closed and racist and and rude to fellow human beings is a downfall in itself. Mm -hmm. I think navigating our way through and getting to a point where we are 
improving systems. And I think it comes to a personality level too, to a person level, because the people are the ones running the systems. So if you have people that care and genuinely want to have a di- diverse and, f- and fair, fair is the wrong term, but um, just open opportunity climate in the United States, then you have to assess like yourself first and then bring your values and virtues into the system, you know? Mm-hmm. I think it's, socialism is an interesting term to use because I think a lot of people when they come to America are fleeing that. Exactly. You know? So I think that, you know, there's so many benefits into, uh, you know, so many cultures working together for the, the good of the country and to keep things moving forward. And a lot of that comes from the conversation of, you know, and it, it, the balance of embracing the traditions of where you're from, but then also not bringing the negative with you when you immigrate to a country, right? That's, a, that's mm-hmm. always an interesting conversation. Um, but there's, there's so many more benefits to immigration and and America in particular, like I said, you know, the way that America has come together because of immigrants and it really is immigrants are the backbone of this country. Everyone at this table came from, you know, somewhere else. And it's a beautiful thing. Um, Yeah. Very proud of that. No, for sure. And I think what you said is important is just not letting that the idea of America and openness turn into the downfall of these people that are fleeing socialism and the idea of like, oh, let's make everything equal and let's have government have all the power and, and disperse out amongst the people. It's it, it's complicated, but we can't let the idea of America and our solutions potentially be our downfall just from being too nice, you know? Like you still have to have processes and procedures in place that have room for improvement, but nonetheless are going to be processing people and giving opportunity out to immigrants trying to make a better life for themselves and their, their families. So I, uh, you guys are, you guys have incredible stories. Like I, <laughs> I was super, I was super uh, stoked to hear them. And I think just all of us coming from different walks of life, it's, it's a beautiful thing to, to be here on U.S. soil, to be blessed enough, and just to be able to speak our minds, you know, it's uh, it's a beautiful thing, and I I truly love that about America. Pretty incredible perspective-wise, thinking about you know hearing your story and yours as well. To think that after all of that, it brought us together today to like have this conversation. Yeah. I'm very grateful for that. Point. So, thanks for thanks for having us on. Yeah, of I course. Know, thank, thank you guys you, for man. coming. Appreciate it. And with that being said, you guys, talking goes a long way.